Do not tell anyone what you have seen and heard until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. You know, every once in a while, there are satirical memes that come out on social media. I love to look at these things because they help me remind that as a Catholic, I'm not perfect, and as a Christian, I'm not perfect, but there's always something to strive for. Well, every once in a while, there's this meme that goes around that's very Monty Python-esque that is the disciples right after Jesus had died, sitting around a campfire, trying to figure out, okay, the Lord who did all these miracles, who we followed this whole time, he's died. What do we do now? And so in the very satirical, Monty Python-esque way, they say, here's what we do. He didn't really die. We tell this whole story, we make up this whole myth, and then... We all stick to the same story, and we're going to fool everybody. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever gotten in trouble and tried to get a story straight with a bunch of people, nobody ever sticks to the same story, let alone for 2,000 years. And so, in that satirical way, they're kind of making a joke of the fact that God's ways are so much better than our ways, and there's no way that this could all be made up. So much so that in our second reading, we heard from St. Peter Obviously, the people that were denying Christ's resurrection and that he had actually come back because Peter says, this is not a myth. We didn't make this up. This isn't from hearsay. We actually witnessed what happened. And now that he has died and risen from the dead and ascended to the Father, now we can tell you that this heavenly voice, as we eclipsed the mountain of transfiguration, came and said, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. But how many times do we not listen to the Lord? The same way that we don't listen to our parents, right? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. This is the Sunday where almost every year I say, take your right hand, put it over your right ear, and pay attention for a moment so it doesn't go in one ear and out the other. But how many times did our parents try that with us, and yet time and time and time again we get in trouble, right? And so why is it then that we assume, if the Lord comes to speak to us, that naturally it's going to be so much more different? We forget that we as Catholics, we as Christians, many times are hypocrites. We do one thing and we say the exact opposite, and we wonder why we live in a world that is so shrouded in sin because... It's made up of sinners. But that means we're sinners too. And we forget that many times that we are not so much part of the problem, though we are because we're sinners, but also we're meant to be part of the solution. We are the hands and feet of God that are being given gifts and talents and skills to come down and to go out. And so when Christ was transfigured in his glorified body, and the law and the prophet of Moses and Elijah were transfigured there, Peter, James, and John that were there and witnessed it, realized in a very real way they were on the footsteps of heaven. That when we die, and in the resurrection of the dead, we will be in our glorified bodies. There will be no more wailing or grinding of teeth, for we will be in the presence of the Lord. The problem, though, is outside of this gospel of the transfiguration, we forget this isn't the first time that someone came down from a mountain and shone like the light of the sun. In fact, this last Wednesday, in our first reading from the book of Exodus, we see this happening another time. Did you know that? This was not the first time that Moses specifically shined with the glory of the sun. But if you read the book of Exodus, you'll see that when he brought the Ten Commandments down the mountain, he was so radiant that Aaron and all of the other Pharisees were afraid, and so they ran away. And Moses said, don't be afraid. It is me, Moses. I have been face to face with the Lord, and when we are face to face with the Lord, we can't have sin in our hearts and in our lives, so we are a little bit different. You know when someone's had a really good day, they just have this glow about them? 
Imagine how amazing it would be to have that great day and be in the presence of God and witness to his love. That's what this glorification is all about. And so when Moses came down and any other time that he was in the presence of the Lord afterward, so as to not make those who were around him afraid, who put a veil over his face so that they could be with him but not be afraid of him. As Peter, James, and John witnessed Moses, Elijah, the prophet, not just one of the prophets, but the prophet, and Jesus in their glorified body, they wanted to remain there. And when you read between the lines, when you hear what St. Peter says, where he says, Lord, should we build three tents? If you don't understand the concept of what's going on there, you're like, That is the most random question that Peter could ever ask Jesus. You're up on this mountain. Hey, can we build three tents? What? They were saying they wanted to stay there for longer. They didn't want to come back down the mountain. They wanted to have that mountaintop experience for a longer time. And then what happens? This bright cloud comes and casts a shadow. And from that cloud, the voice of God booms. Behold, my beloved son. In whom I am well pleased, listen to him. Many times when we as sinners come before the presence of the Lord, we have the same response as Peter, James, and John in today's gospel. We fall down. Lord, I am not worthy. We lay prostrate one of the most humble signs of submission that there is in our faith. And we have to be told, be not afraid, rise. In fact, as a priest, there's twice in formation that we specifically take that same gesture of humility, where we lay prostrate before the altar at both our diaconate ordination and our priestly ordination. To lay prostrate is to lay basically flat down on the body, on your stomach, with your hands in front of your face so you're not like suffocated by the ground (laughs) and to be there in total submission it's one of those gestures that we as Catholics many times forget is a proper gesture for prayer a a, a gesture of submission but not just at the diaconate ordination the priestly ordination there's one other time a year every single year where the priest and deacon both lay prostrate before the altar do you remember when it is? I quizzed everybody last night, and I got one answer. You were here last night, Kathy. You cheated. (laughs) Yes, Good Friday. The priest and the deacon walk in with the servers in silence and come before the altar and lay prostrate before the altar. Not out of fear, but out of submission. The one day a year where we are forbidden from celebrating Mass The priest and the deacon come before the altar that is stripped bare into a church where Christ is not reserved in the tabernacle. And we lay down and basically say, into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. Your will, not mine. And so when Peter, James, and John are laying prostrate, the Lord Jesus walks over to them and says, rise, be not afraid. But how many times do we allow fear to dictate our actions in life or to dictate our inactions in life? Sometimes we're so afraid to say something or do something because we don't want to make anybody upset. That's one of the things that I struggle with as a pastor and as a priest is that my nature is a people pleaser. That doesn't work well as a pastor because no matter what I do or I don't do, someone's going to be upset with my decision. It's amazing I can say something or not say something. I can preach for five minutes. I can preach for 50 minutes. Don't worry, this is not a 50 minute yet. I can have chant as music. I can have praise and worship as music. I can do Mass in Latin. I can do Mass in Spanish, Mass in English, Mass pro popolo, Mass ad orientum. No matter what I do, someone's not going to like it. So sometimes we have that, well, Lord, what's the purpose? Why should I even try if someone's going to get mad no matter what I do? Listen to him. Not me. 
him. <laughs> what does Christ say? Remember, when you were persecuted for the sake of righteousness, that they first persecuted me. Touche, Lord. Touche. That many times we forget being a Catholic, being a Christian, and allow, allowing the way, the truth, and the life to be our motivator in life and our guidepost in life means that we're going to upset people sometimes when we call them to truth. Because when we are living by sin, the last thing we want to hear is that we're wrong. Is there anybody present here today that did not get mad at their parents growing up? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Anybody? No! I wager to bet... Nine times out of ten, the reason you were mad at your parents is because they said no. Sound about right? And why did they say no? Not because they don't love you, but because they do and they don't want you to be hurt. That believe it or not, mom and dad, nine times out of ten, do know best. Now, I realize the kids are going to attack me when I say that. Father, come on, man. Don't make me listen to my parents. Number four, honor your father and your mother. But father, I mean, I'm a free young adult. You're 13. You're a teenager. You need to learn. You need to grow. And you have to have those parents that are willing to speak the truth to you. Even when your response is, I hate you, because they love you. Now, I realize it's a very controversial homily today because we live in such a world today where we're supposed to be our kids' best friends. I appreciate the fact that you're laughing, Janelle. <laughs> Because that's part of the struggle in our world today is we have lost the identity of what it means to be a parent. We have lost the identity of what it means to form our young people that you know what? If you leave young people to their own devices, I don't know if you've read Lord of the Flies, but I learned as a teenager it doesn't work well. The piggy always gets picked on. And you always eat the fat kid first. Read Lord of the Flies, it makes sense. <laughs> but that's part of the struggle in our world. Is that we forget what the Lord told us. And what it means for us as Catholics and Christians and sons and daughters of God. That if life is easy, you may not be doing it right. But Father, I want life to be easy. Preach, so do I. <laughs> but that doesn't come sometimes with the title of son and daughter of God. Practicing what we preach sometimes means saying no in the moment so that you can help them grow to understand why you said no in the future. I'll ask you adults, of all of you who got mad at your parents for saying no to you as a child, did anybody in here not at some point in their 20s or 30s regurgitate something their parents said? Did anybody do that? No one's, no one's, okay, a couple hands are raised. I was like, well, maybe it's just me. I will never forget the first time my dad's words came out of my mouth. I looked at myself and said, And it was something along the lines of, failure to plan on your part does not constitute an emergency on mine. One of the most common quoted things in my household, because as you know, I'm a little bit of a procrastinator, which meant if I had something due on Monday, Sunday night at 11.30, hey dad, I need a poster board. <laughs> Tough. But he would always go to Walmart, because they're open 24-7. <laughs> they were at least back then. And he'd go there and get one for me. Because even though he wanted to offer me that tough love, he would still be there with me, castigating me, of course, shaming me. You should know better. I know I should know better. Dad, but I got to get this done. 
and he'd be with me at the dinner table every night until my grades got better because he knew that if my grades were at a certain level, it wasn't because I wasn't smart enough. It was because I was a lazy procrastinator. And how is it the same for many of us as well? That we procrastinate in the faith. We procrastinate with, well, you know what, I'll get to it someday. I'll be faithful when I'm sick. I'll be faithful when I'm older. I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of death these last few weeks. I was talking with someone yesterday. I've had five either parishioners, former parishioners, or former friends that have died in the last 14 days. Three of them were not expected. We know neither the day nor the hour. Stop procrastinating. I've seen a great model of faith for me is one of my brother priests. Many of us have been praying for Father Jacoby at Holy Spirit and Mustang. He has the same um, brain cancer that Paul Warnke has that's inoperable and basically is an 18-month death sentence. Well, yesterday we got an email from the archbishop giving us an update that he's stepping down from active ministry because he can't see anymore, he can't process the same anymore, he can't function how he knows an administrator or a pastor needs to. But he hasn't lost faith. He hasn't lost hope. He's still going to do whatever he can to witness to the love of God. I don't know about you, but if I was given an 18-month death sentence, I don't know if I'd be happy about it. But when we're born, we are given a death sentence. At some point in our lives, the Lord will call us home which means we are going to die to this world and die to this life. So how do we live here? So that when the Lord calls us home, we can truly have that opportunity to live forever in eternity. Talk about those, those memes that I like. There's one that came out about six weeks ago that I shared on Facebook that said, why is it that you want to go to heaven if you don't like to go to Mass? And I said, I like that. As a priest, ever, anytime I can encourage people to go to Mass, I like that. But when you look a little bit deeper, what is it saying? Why would you want to be in the presence of God eternally if you don't want to spend an hour with Him every week? If you can't sacrifice that hour with Him every week, why would you want to continue to be with Him who you don't want to be with here on earth? Well, because for most of us, it's not so much that we want to go to heaven, we don't want to go to hell. It's a place to start. That's a good place to start. But then how do we grow into being people of God? We can't allow fear to dictate our actions. And so no matter what obstacles you're facing in life, whether it be a life change, whether it be a relationship change, whether it be a school change, whether it be a conversation of how do I maintain how I am or how do I grow into something else, listen to what the Lord says. Rise, be not afraid. But Father, it's so much easier to say that than to do it. I agree. <laughs> because one of the reasons why I struggle to be a pastor is that many times I have fear in my life. Fear that if I make this decision, I'll upset these people. If I make this decision, I'll upset these people. That's a realistic fear for many of us. And so I want you to know that if I've ever upset you with any decision that I've made, that was not my intentionality of any decision I've ever made. You may think, yeah, right, Father. You know what you did. You know why you did it. You did it just to make me mad. No, I didn't. <laughs> I did it because just as the Father tells me no, as my earthly mother and father told me no, sometimes as the spiritual leader, I have to say no for what's the best for the good of the whole community of faith. Because we are all sinners, myself included. Which means sometimes we can't get what we want, when we want it, how we want it. But the Lord will off, always offer us what we need, where we need it, when we need it. 
But just like with our parents, we don't want many times what's best for us. We'd rather make mistakes and learn for ourselves. But as my parents love me, as our Heavenly Father loves you, I seek to be a loving example for you. Which means sometimes I'm going to do something that upsets you. And I, and I apologize wholeheartedly for that. That is never my intention. But whatever you're facing, even if it means having a conversation with Father you don't want to have, be not afraid. Let the Lord love you. And then we may all have that opportunity to spend eternity not in hell, but in the presence of God who changes our outlook on life.